Our next speaker is Nathan Hall. You got a bit of an introduction in the first talk, which yeah. may, may have been more luck than judgment, I don't know, but it was very well timed from my point of view as a yeah. Um, same thing again, half yep. an hour, time for questions. Yep, no problem at all. Um, Thank you very much. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, Paul and I had a, a small panic this morning um, when uh, we realised that we didn't know what each other were going to talk about, but actually it was uh, likely to be rather similar. Um, in some regards, there is some overlap in, in what I'm saying and what Paul's saying, but I've decided um, uh, to, to, uh, to play a little bit of devil's advocate here and throw, if I can, a few spanners in the work and, uh, and, uh, and throw a, f um, a, a th few questions and ideas um, out, to, out, out to you. Um, uh, that way I hope there won't be too much in the way of uh, repetitive, uh, uh, repetitive stuff. And, and of course, my own view has long been that, um, uh, Paul mentioned the critics of, of hate crime and hate crime legislation, and, and my view has long been that actually if we're going to proceed and if we're going to move forward, we need to address those concerns, and we need to uh, address them fully, and we need to, uh, uh, to, to, to put them down um, uh, to, to the best of our ability. Um, my title, um, I went for the academic sort of uh, uh, waffly title, uh, some reflections on theoretical and practical complexities of defining and conceptualising hate and hate crime. Um, that's academic speak for what is hate crime. Um, so uh, what, I, what I thought I'd do is just reflect on some, some, some of the, 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 the notions of hate crime that we have in theory um, and also uh, some of the uh, notions that, uh, that, that these notions, how they impact upon um, law enforcement um, in particular. Um, in, in specific ways. Um, so it's about defining, it's about conceptualising. Paul's already mentioned some issues around uh, the complexities of this word called hate. Um, so that's very helpful. That mo allows me to move on to, uh, to, to, to other things. Um, before we start, I wasn't sure if we were going to do the introduction. So just a little bit uh, about, uh, about me. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in criminology and um, policing um, at the Institute of Criminal Justice Studies at the University of Portsmouth. I'm a member, as, as Paul said, of the, uh, in quotation, feisty um, uh, cross-government hate crime independent advisory group with, uh, Sylvia. with Sylvia. Sorry? I meant Sylvia. I thought you might have done. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I also uh, am a member of the um, Association of Chief Police Officers Hate Crime um, Working Group, um, um, a member of the UK delegation on occasions to the OSCE. Uh, organizations for security and cooperation in Europe um, and I have worked in relation to uh, uh, the work of Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary uh, in relation to hate crime um, and uh, one of my, my favourite uh, roles is uh, an independent advisor on diversity and uh, prejudice and discrimination to Arsenal Football Club which explains why uh, uh, Paul and I went to the game uh, last week and, and he's only just um, stopped being upset about that. Um, so that's a little bit um, uh, about me. Um, in terms of, uh, of setting, I'm conscious that I'm standing in the way of people here, so if I uh, wander around a, a bit. Um, I, I'd like to make a number of points about um, uh, our starting point, really. And I've said here that before we can examine, really, any of the issues um, that relate to, to, to hate crime generally, whether it's victimisation, whether it's uh, how much hate crime there is, whether it's about perpetrators, whether it's about responses, whatever, um, we have to have, and I've put a clear understanding of what it is that we're talking about. Well, Paul's uh, talks already, already alluded to the fact that this clear understanding may well be uh, impossible to, uh, to, to achieve, but it is important that we have some sort of understanding about what this thing called hate crime is. Um, the question, what is hate crime, might on the face of it seem uh, straightforward. Paul's talk has alluded to the fact that it isn't. It's more than alluded to. It's stated that it isn't um, straightforward. And I'll add some, uh, some other conceptual issues um, to, uh, to, to, to illustrate why this question, or answering this question accurately, is fraught with all sorts of, uh, all sorts of difficulties. Um, I'll also make the point that, like any other crime, hate crime is a social construction. Um, but there is uh, little consensus around the world, um, as, uh, as was sort of alluded to in Kieran's presentation, um, about what hate crime actually is amongst whether it's academics, uh, such as myself and, uh, and Paul and others, um, whether it's policy makers, um, or whether it's uh, practitioners. Okay, if you look around the world in terms of various definitions, um, you'll see that actually they vary uh, quite considerably um, from country to country. And in, in many cases, within countries as well, particularly if you take the, uh, 
uh, the United States where there are numerous definitions at the federal, local, state uh, level as well. Um, so I'm going to have a look at this issue of the social construction of hate crime and the hate crime problem um, and uh, have a look at some of the definitions um, that have been put forward in an attempt to, 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 to explain and conceptualise this, this th thing called hate crime. Um, I want to also have a look at some of the inherent difficulties associated with defining hate crime um, and uh, to discuss the practical implications, particularly for law uh, and law enforcement, given the title of this uh, symposium. Um, the issue of law, obviously, is, is of considerable um, interest. Um, I'm glad I'm not the only one doing a shameless plug for my book. Um, thank you, Paul, for uh, <laughs> making this bit a lot, a lot easier. Um, I've argued that criminology is really about finding answers to seven questions. Okay. Um, applying criminology, sociology, philosophy, whatever, to the issue of hate crime. Those seven questions I put on the screen there. Um, what is hate crime? First of all, we need to know what the problem is. <coughs> uh, how much of it is there? We'll see that has considerable implications for responses. Um, who is affected? And, and by that I mean not just uh, uh, victims but also perpetrators. So who's, uh, who's involved in, uh, in perpetration and victimisation? Uh, where is it occurring? Judging by uh, Kieran's uh, talk this, uh, this morning that kicked us off, um, uh, it's an issue that is of some concern um, around the world. Um, when, it is, when is it con uh, occurring? Um, Paul alluded to the fact that there's been considerable interest um, in recent years and recent decades um, in this issue of hate crime. But actually, you don't have to search the history books very hard uh, or very far to, uh, to find that actually this thing called hate crime has been occurring uh, for, for, for many centuries. It's not a new phenomenon at all. What is perhaps new is its society's uh, interest within it. Um, the other question is, why is it occurring? So, so why is this thing happening? Why are these issues, these events occurring? Uh, and finally, I guess, which is uh, uh, the, the key question for, for many of us around, the, uh, around the, uh, the room today, is what can be done to make the situation better, whatever better may look like? Um, now, I would argue that the answers to these six questions here are almost entirely dependent upon our answer to the first one. Yeah, there's a couple of nods around the room, so that's good. I'm, people are with me. We're going places now. Um, so those, the rest of the questions, all the things we seek to understand about hate crime is dependent upon how we define and conceptualise this thing called uh, hate and this thing called hate crime. Um, if we think about the types of de definition that exist um, around the world, they can largely, I think, be divided into three, uh, three general areas. Those that are academic, those that are legal, uh, and derived largely from legal definitions are operational ones, those that serve as some sort of practical guidance to uh, criminal justice agencies um, and officials around the world. Now, in many respects, you know, uh, Paul talked about the... Um, uh, the, the various academic definitions and how there's a little consensus. Um, it, it, in some ways, that, that is almost encapsulated within our little academic world. There is a case for saying, well, actually, it doesn't really matter if academics can't uh, come to some agreement about what this thing called hate crime is. But what becomes important is where things in the real world happen in, in legal and, and operational uh, definitions. So the academic argument and uh, <coughs> debates that go on around uh, definitions take place, of course they do, and, and they, they, they serve uh, important functions in terms of research and understanding the problem. Um, but actually, you know, the issues, bearing in mind the, the, the title of the symposium, When um, Hate and Law Collide, um, the legal and operational definitions that serve to guide the activities of, uh, of practical responses to hate crime, I think, uh, are, are arguably more important within our context uh, than, than the academic um, definitions. Apologies to academics around the room. Um, uh, don't shoot me for that. Um, what is also important, I think, is this comment from uh, Berkman and Turpin Petrosino. Now, it's nearly a decade old, this statement. But I think there is 
uh, some legitimacy in it still. That there is no consensus among social scientists or lawmakers on definitional elements that would constitute a global description of hate crime. Part of the reason for this lies in the fact that cultural differences, social norms and political interests play a large role in defining crime in general and hate crime in particular. Now when we consider uh, Kieran's presentation at the start of the different types of hate, different types of discrimination, different types of prejudice that are contained within different pieces of legislation um, around Europe and indeed around the world, you can see the impact of cultural differences between countries. You can see the impact of social norms, you can see the impact of political interests and there are those who would argue that hate crime is uh, almost entirely a politically driven um, uh, phenomenon. So we can see that the complexities of defining and conceptualising hate crime are reflected in the different pieces of legislation, the different um, issues that are covered uh, and, and the different things that, that, that laws attempt to deal with um, around, around the world. Um, one might then argue that given the different th criteria that Kieran highlighted, that actually when you look at all these things that come under the umbrella banner of hate crime, that actually we're not talking about the same thing. When we go to different places, hate crime means different things to different people. And therefore it becomes quite tricky to say, well, hate crime is um, is, is one phenomena and, and it always is the same and we all understand what we mean by it. Clearly we don't. Um, different people have different concepts and different understandings of what this thing called hate crime, uh, hate crime is. And that's some of the, those are some of the issues that I want to explore um, during, uh, during this presentation for the next 20 minutes or so. This is going to test your eyesight, see if you brought your, uh, your binoculars. Um, this is from um, uh, our last government, the Labour government's um, uh, hate crime action plan um, contains the definitions of, of hate uh, and hate crime that we use um, in England and Wales. Um, and just so you don't strain your eyes, I'll, I'll read these to you. Um, hate motivation is defined as hate crimes and incidents are taken to mean any crime or incident where the perpetrator's hostility, we can add that to bias and we can add that to prejudice, um, or prejudice against an identifiable group of people is a factor in determining who is victimised. Okay. Now this instantly raises a number of questions in terms of our definition because we have here <coughs> crimes and we have incidents which might not be crimes. Um, it can be any crime. Other countries stipulate which crime it has to be in some cases. Um, where the perpetrator's hostility, not necessarily hate, but hostility, um, and I know Paul's going to mention this in his presentation, um, so I won't say too much about it, but, but hostility uh, in, in England, as we refer to the common dif dictionary definition, um, which will include things like unfriendliness and, uh, uh, and the general broad range of, uh, of emotions. <clears throat> All prejudice against an identifiable group of people. Now, that raises questions about what is an identifiable group of people. We all have our own you know, characteristics, we're all identifiable in one way or another, um, is a factor, but it doesn't say how much of a factor. Does it have to be a big factor, just a small motivating factor, in determining who is victimised? And the included subjects is quite interesting. It's a broad and inclusive definite definition, absolutely it is. Um, a victim does not have to be a member of the group. In fact, anyone, and this is important, anyone could be a victim of hate crime. Now, critics would argue that if anybody can be a victim of hate crime, then we've automatically already abolished the concept altogether. Because then it just becomes crime if anybody can be a victim of it. That's one of the arguments that the critics will put forward to. Now, in terms of hate incidents, any non-crime incident which is perceived, so perceived by the victim or any other person to be motivated by a hostility or prejudice based on a person's, and these are the categories, race, religion, sexual orientation, disability, or transgender. Right. So we've identified the prejudices that we, uh, uh, that, that are in inverted commas, acceptable in this, in this manner. Um, 
But one of the key elements here is which is perceived by the victim or any other person. And, and I know that Paul's going to mention this again later, so I won't say too much. But this is uh, a legacy from uh, the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. Stephen was murdered in 1993. Uh, the inquiry in 1999 said that anybody should have the ability to report a hate crime if they think they have been a victim. Uh, and, and therefore, the responsibility uh, of, uh, uh, was taken away from the police in determining who was a victim. Right, so it's entirely victim-oriented um, definition. Right, so racial group includes um, ethnic background, uh, gypsy and traveller groups as well. Religious groups include those who have no faith, um, and so on and so forth. So the definitions that we adopt in the UK are very broad, and these are operational definitions, remember. Very broad and victim-oriented. Um, <coughs> Hate crimes. A hate crime is any criminal offence which is perceived by the victim or any other person as being motivated by hostility or prejudice based on a person's race or perceived race, religion or perceived religion, sexual orientation, disability or transgender. Okay. So we have crimes, we have incidents, we have perceptions, we have a stated number of uh, prejudices that we record under. I know Paul will say some more about that later on. So we have a very broad definition of, of, of hate crime. Um, if we bring in uh, a piece of legislation that, that um, Kieran's uh, uh, um, slide had a, had a question mark under the, uh, <laughs> under the flag there, um, one of the key pieces of legislation that we have, and i uh, absolutely right to say that we don't have any legislation that says hate crime in the title. Um, we've mentioned the, the Criminal Justice Act of 2003, which includes provisions for enhanced sentencing for um, sexual orientation and disability. But if we take the Crime and Disorder Act of 1998, which deals with racially and religiously aggravated and motivated offences, this is about as close as we get to, to um, hate crime uh, legislation. And this says, an offence is racially aggravated if at the time of committing the offence, or immediately before or after doing so, the offender demonstrates towards the victim of uh, the offence hostility based on the uh, of the offence hostility based on the victim's membership or presumed membership of a racial group. Uh, B. The offence is motivated wholly or partly by hostility towards members of a racial group based on their membership of of that group. Now, I don't want to go into the legal side of things. So I'll leave that to, uh, to to CPS later. But from from an academic point of view, we might start to think about well, you know, how soon is immediately before or after? Is that 10 seconds? Is that a minute? Is it three minutes? What does immediately mean? Um, how does an offender demonstrate hostility? If they don't say anything, um, how do we know what they're thinking? Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, then we come back to the thing about what is hostility? It's far removed from hate. All sorts of academic questions there. Uh, in part B, the offence is motivated wholly or partly. Well, wholly is not problematic. If the offence is motivated wholly by hostility, fine. But what does this thing partly mean? How much of a part? An eighth? A quarter? Half? Yeah. Serious questions. I won't go into the practical implications of that because that, I suspect, may come a little later on. So what we have is a legal definition that's different to our operational definition, one that is considerably narrower, necessarily, because of the uh, requirements of, of, of criminal law, but nevertheless different to, to one that is operationally used by uh, the police and other criminal justice agencies. Now, so what? Well, this becomes increasingly important, and I'll go back to uh, Jacobs and Potter and their uh, criminal law and identity politics book that Paul uh, raised in his presentation. And another quote from them, and I'm rather pleased that you didn't use this quote from them, Paul, that helped a lot, um, is, is this, that how much hate crime there is and what the appropriate response should be depends upon how hate crime is uh, conceptualised and defined. And that for me is a really important sentiment. I just want to, uh, to explore that for, for a few minutes. And this is where I start to play devil's advocate a little bit. If we have a look at Jacobs and Potter's conceptualisation, um, and, uh, and it's from their book, Criminal Law and Identity Politics, they pr provide us with what I think is, is an interesting and challenging theoretical conceptualisation of this thing called hate crime. And they say, in a nutshell, this, that for a crime to become a hate crime, two things have to happen. One, you have to have an offender who is prejudiced, right? biased, hostile, 
hating, whatever. So you have to have an offender who is prejudiced. And for ease of argument, they say that prejudice is either high or it's low. Right? So you either have somebody who's very prejudiced or somebody who's eh, not so much. The second element, they say, is that there has to be a causal relationship between the offender's prejudice and the commission of the offence. Okay. So in other words, the offence has to be caused by the offender's hate, prejudice. Okay. And they say, again for ease of argument, that that causal relationship is either strong, so it's high, or it's not very strong. Okay. So that's our starting point. We must have an offender who is prejudiced, and we must have an offence that is motivated to some degree by that um, by that prejudice. Now let's say there are four categories that are quite interesting for our conceptualization here. The first they say is relatively unproblematic. That we have offenders who are highly prejudiced and that prejudice strongly motivates their offending. So you, you know you're real haters and you'll all know from your own experience examples uh, of that. One that springs to mind from uh, England and Wales perhaps David Copeland, the, uh, the, the London nail bomber who set off bombs uh, targeting various uh, diverse communities in London uh, in 1999, I think. And Jackson and Potter say, this, is, this isn't very complicated. If this is what we mean by hate crime, this isn't complicated because we've got offenders who really hate their victims and that hate is the cause of their offence. Yeah. They say, if this is what we mean by hate crime, then we won't have, have many hate crimes because these offenders are rare. <laughs> they say things become a bit complicated depending on the definitions that are adopted around the world. They say, for example, what if one of these offenders um, commits an offence against a uh, minority group or a member of a minority group for reasons other than hate? So they give an example that you know, if a white supremacist goes um, shoplifting um, in a, um, a store owned by uh, somebody who is black, for example, because they, they're hungry or because they want to acquire the goods, is that still a hate crime? They're still targeting somebody that they're known to dislike or hate, um, but is that motivated by hate? Well, it depends on your definition. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. They say we can further complicate things. What if you have an offender who's not particularly prejudiced, but will target different groups. And the example that they give is of um, an African-American street robber uh, in New York by the name of Dante Carter, who was active in the early 90s, I think. And they say, well, you know, Dante Carter would always target white men, always. And when he was finally arrested and they asked him why he targeted white men, his answer was because they're rich. Which I suppose if you're a street robber, is, you know, guides your working activities. Um, so he targeted people who were different to him, but not because he necessarily hated them, but because he had some other rationale. Now, Jacobs and Potter say that it's this group here that the US statistics are caught up with, because there's a tendency to say, well, anybody who targets anybody who's, a different, who's different to them it must be a hate crime. <coughs> yeah, bless you. Um, and finally, they complicate it even more by saying, well, you know, what if there are people who are not very prejudiced uh, uh, and you know, there's not much link between that prejudice and their offending behaviour, um, but they still exist. And I use this example with um, my students when I teach this at the university. I, ask, I won't ask you to do this, because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but they say, so then, you know, how many of you drive a car? And a load of them, before the fees go up, a load of them put their hands up and say, yes, I've got a car, I drive a car. And then I say to them, how many of you have ever been cut up by another car at a roundabout or a junction? And they put their hands up. And then I say to them, how many of you in that split instant that you are cut up by another car say something, usually involving naughty words? So they put their hands up. And then I say, well, how many of you would say those naughty words and throw in something that you've noticed about the other driver? Old, young, Male, female. And then all of a sudden they start to think, oh, oh, I might have used something, some characteristic. And then I say to them, well, where did that come from? We wouldn't class ourselves as haters or hate offenders. But sometimes that spark is so spontaneous that we don't know where it comes from. That raises all sorts of questions about this thing called hate and what it is and where it comes from. 
Right. Um, and Jason and Potter say there are all sorts of these um, frictions in everyday life. I know, Paul, you've mentioned that in, in, in your book, the frictions of everyday life that, that, that will cause um, anger or annoyance. And, and, and it's something, you know, these, these words, these epithets, these comments just appear. Now, Jason and Potter say if we're going to include this category as hate crime, then we might well have an infinite number of offences. Depending on how you conceptualise it and how you define it, whether you take one of these boxes, two of them, three of them, all four of them, will entirely determine how many hate crimes you have in your society. So if you only have box one, you might be all right. You might not have very many. If you're going to include all four, and bearing in mind the UK's definition, operational definition at least, uh, we, anybody can be a victim of hate crime if they perceive themselves to be so, um, it's likely then we'll have a great many number of hate crimes and hate incidents. Because we're not just talking about crimes in the UK, we're talking about incidents as well. So that's, in a nutshell, what they're arguing. Well, let's have a look at this in practice then. And again, um, uh, you'll need your binoculars out. This is from the OSCE um, report in 2009 into uh, reports of member states the number of hate crimes in member states. And we're particularly interested in cases recorded by the police, which is this column. So um, Andorra, none, Austria, 61. And again, in this column, we've got what's recorded and what's not, which relates to, to, to Kieran's presentation about are we measuring the same thing? Um, Belgium, 1,103. Belarus, 72. Estonia, 2. Uh, Croatia, 32. So you get some sort of sense of the vagaries of, of what's going on around Europe. Um, Georgia, 41. Germany, 4,583. Greece, 2. Um, Hungary, 15. Iceland, none. Italy, 142. And so on and so forth. And so you come down, uh, d down the list, Moldova, 2. And then we come to something that's very interesting. Because you go 236 for Norway, 209 for Poland, Sweden, 5,797. Then we come to England, 52,102. Let's not go to England. That, <laughs> that looks scary. Um, but what's interesting further, and this is something I examined in my, in my PhD, is if we have to go back a year because the US uh, stats weren't available. Cases recorded by the police in 2008. In England, 46,300. In the USA which has a population of uh, 300 million or so, 7,783. Right, so what that means is the way you define and conceptualise hate crime means that actually there's very little uniformity. We can't say with any degree of certainty that these are the same things. Yeah? Because the definition in the US, they very often will have definitions that place the burden um, of decision making on the police officer rather than on the victim. They're interested in crimes, not in incidents. So this, this definitional difference gives us these, or helps to, uh, helps to understand all these vagaries that we see in the numbers. And it, what it really means is you can't take these numbers at face value because they're not measuring the same thing. They can't be because we have different definitions and def different um, legal requirements. Um, okay, so... To summarise some of the, the key points there, to conceptualise hate crime, I put adequately there, tentatively, um, we must consider a number of key questions. First, what prejudices, when transformed into action, are we going to criminalise? I mentioned the five that we have in England and Wales. Kira mentioned other motivations that uh, different countries have in their legislation. Point that Paul raised. How do we know if these actions are a hate crime? How do we know? How do we know what the offender's thinking? This slippery concept of hate and hostility and all the rest of it uh, makes this quite tricky. Um, what crimes are we going to include? We include in England and Wales any, def uh, any um, um, incident perceived by the victim. Other countries have a specif specified list of offences and if you're outside of that list it can't be a hate crime. That's important, uh, important implications. Um, which groups, and I'm a little uncomfortable with this word acceptable, but in playing devil's advocate, it, 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 it's quite interesting. Which groups are acceptable to us as victims? If you say, well, we're going to have uh, race, we're going to have religion, we're going to have sexual orientation, uh, and, and, and a selected number of others, it places us in a, in a conceptual uh, minefield, because there, critics would argue that what we're saying is that those, vic um, those um, issues of victimisation are more important than others. 
we create, if we're not careful, a hierarchy of victimization that says your victimization is more important than yours. Yeah. And some of my students have said to me in the past that they, 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 some of them um, have had problems with bullying at school because of their hair colour or because of their size, but they're not categorised and they're not included as hate crimes, necessarily. Um, so, which groups? And, and if we make a list, as I said, we're in danger of creating a hierarchy of victimisation. If we say, well, everybody can be a victim of hate crime, then <coughs> you're just, just left with crime, aren't you? Um, so that's an important question. Um, how strong must the relationship between the prejudice and the offence be? Does hate crime have to be wholly motivated by hate? These notions of prejudice and hostility and bias, um, which is, well, no, I find the most interesting of bias, um, is, um, you know, is important. How strong does that relationship need to be before we can say, yes, this crime has become a hate crime? And Jacobson Potter argue that, you know, uh, all crimes are motivated by some sort of prejudice, whether it's um, lust, <coughs> bless you, whether it's lust, whether it's revenge, whether it's, you know, whatever, financial uh, greed or whatever. There's some sort of prejudice there. Um, must that link be wholly or just partly causal? Yeah. Can we come back to the issue of motivation? Uh, who's going to decide these things? Is it going to be judges? Is it going to be the police? Is it going to be prosecutors? Is it going to be the victim? Is it going to be the community? Important. Um, how will we decide these things? Because again, we are constructing a problem. Yeah. And as we can see from these issues, particularly in terms of motivation and social norms and cultural differences, hate crime is arguably uniquely sensitive to this construction problem. Um, and, of course, the point that, that, that Paul raised that I won't go on about too much is that how can we guard against hatred without impinging upon people's basic democratic pr freedoms? You know, particularly these issues in the US when I was there doing my research, the, the, the notion of the First Amendment always came up, always. Um, and it's about, you know, the, as Paul mentioned, the, the, the issues of freedom of expression um, and so on and so forth. So there are some really complicated questions. And when we go open to questions, I'd be really grateful if nobody could ask me any of these because that would make life a lot easier, thank you. Um, <laughs> but these are important questions that we need to think about, we need to address, because this is the kind of thing that critics throw at us. Yep. And until we can get over some of these issues and provide a robust response, and the argument that hate crimes hurt more and the increasing um, uh, evidence, for a long, long time, the evidence was patchy, and critics, it's very easy for critics to say, well, you know, you've only got two or three little studies, and it doesn't really show anything, you can't generalise. So the data's building, the research is building, and we can start to address some of these, some of these questions, but they haven't gone away uh, at all. Um, uh, just to wrap up, I'd like to bring some of this into the world of, of criminal law. Um, because our, cr our, our definitions obviously determine how we respond to the problem, um, how much hate crime there is, and so on and so forth. But there also is a question about the propriety of this as something that can be dealt with by criminal law. Um, and one of the interesting aspects about criminal law, uh, or the application of law, can actually, in my view, be traced back to this guy, Roscoe Pound, um, who is an American um, legal scholar. Um, and as you can see, writing the best part of 100 years ago. Um, and in 1917, he gave a speech um, that uh, addressed the limitations, as he saw them, of the effective use of criminal law. Um, now, obviously, hate crime wasn't on the radar then. This is about the application of law generally. But actually, I think this has some important points for consideration for us, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this. Um, forgive the language. This is... Uh, early 20th century legal scholar. Uh, I'll, I'll translate it into, uh, into English um, in, in a moment. Um, he said that the effectiveness of law and law enforcement will be limited by any attempt to control attitudes or beliefs rather than observable behaviour. Right, right, so you're 1917. Um, Paul mentioned the fact that you know, hate crime is about proving issues around attitudes and beliefs. Now, that's okay if these are transformed into actions, if somebody says something, if there's some graffiti or you know, the written word or whatever. But actually, I think this has an important implication for us. Law, effectiveness of law, and law enforcement limited by any attempt to control attitudes or beliefs rather than observable behaviour. Second point, the effectiveness of law will be limited by the necessity that law 
uh, be enforced by external agencies and for the most part invoked by the public. Now, this is this was the key bit that my PhD was, was interested in, really, about you know, whether the police in particular have the ability and the desire to respond to hate crimes, and whether victims, or the wider public, have the ability and the desire and the confidence to report uh, their victimisation. Because, of course, if the public, generally speaking, don't report what's happening to them to the police, then we have serious problems, and we know that hate crimes are uh, considerably underreported. If the external agencies don't have the, um, such as the police, have the ability and the desire to respond to the problem, and that's partially, you know, can be attributable to the size of the problem because of the stretch in resources, then we also have a, 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 an issue. So th there's some interesting things that come out of that, but that's a different story. Um, the effectiveness of law will be limited by the notion that whilst there are interests and demands that it might be desirable for the law to recognise, the reality of such demands, particularly concerning issues of clarity concerning legal precepts and the limitations of law which arise from the difficulty of ascertaining the facts on which the law is to operate, mean that by their very nature they cannot be safeguarded in law. In other words, nice idea, right thing to do, too difficult to prove motivation. So morally, yes, it might be the right thing to do, but practically proving hate motivation is incredibly difficult because arguably, arguably, it's an attempt to control attitudes and beliefs that are not necessarily observable in every case. Some of you think that. And finally, um, the effectiveness of law will be limited if it appeared to the public and the police to be useless and disruptive rather than serving to repair social relations. Now, critics of hate crime legislation will say that the existence, the very existence of hate crime laws cement differences between groups. And actually that creates a further problem, or is part, part of the problem, because it highlights social differences. In the same way that hate crime discriminates, critics would argue so do hate crime laws because they set groups apart and provide this hierarchy of victimisation and so on. So just some issues to throw into the mix here, and it may be when we come to the practical issues this afternoon that that might be of, uh, uh, of more interest. But actually what we have to uh, say is that you know, responding to hate crimes by law or with law is fraught with difficulty. Um, so just to summarise then, defining hate crime is difficult. Um, and when we dis deconstruct it, Obviously, there are two parts. There's the crime bit, and then there's the hate bit. And there is, of course, um, this notion that there isn't very much um, agreement about what hate is. And there are complexities and implications, and, and, and Paul mentioned earlier this issue of, of what is hate? What do we mean by hate? Hate is, you know, in, in the lay terms, we might understand it as a, a, um, a very strong emotive emotion. But actually we're talking about hostility, we're talking about prejudice, we're talking about bias, and so on and so forth. So what prejudices are unacceptable? Are we in danger of socially constructing a hierarchy of difference, where some are perceived to be more deserving of extra protection, in inverted commas, than others? Are we talking about crimes or incidents? I would reiterate here that I am playing a bit of devil's advocate. I don't necessarily... Uh, uh, agree with all of the things that are coming here. But there are issues about crimes and causal links. How do we prove that hate crime has occurred? The crime is motivated by the prejudice. How do we know? And ultimately, we come back to the point that hate crime is a social construction. And that's illustrated, I think, quite clearly by the number of hate crimes that you find in different countries. Yeah? Hate crime means different things to different people at different times, depending on where you are. Um, and, of course, there are practical uh, implications for law in law enforcement. Yeah, it's obviously easier to deal with 7,000 hate crimes, in theory, than it is to deal with 52,000. There are resource implications. There are implications for victims in terms of receiving service provision. Um, and, and, of course, in terms of uh, responding through prosecutions, and so on and so forth. So there are all sorts of um, implications, not just for law and law enforcement, but for... Um, victims, for communities, for the wider public, and also for the social context and the historical context in which uh, this response to hate crime takes place. And I'm done. Thank you. Is everybody still awake? <laughs> okay, I'll try to avoid. <laughs>
the list. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> very grateful if you would. Thank you. <laughs> uh, two things, really. Uh, one thing is, I totally agree with you on, I mean, your starting point about how you shape the initial context will frame and shape yeah. whatever happens after that. And then it seems to me, and since you also demonstrated, and Kieran demonstrated earlier, that it seems to be, I mean, uh, really the fact seems to be that there is no concept of mm. this crime. Mm. Uh, but there are many, as you said, operational definitions. Yes, of yes. Crime, right? Uh, so the question is then, can they be subsumed under some sort of general concept? And, and I guess that's one of the sort of um, missions of this project then. To, and it occurs to me that in order to start working on that, you have to discuss a lot about what would the criteria be mm. of a good definition of that sort. Uh, so could it be that a good definition, a good general definition actually would exclude some of the operational definitions that are actually out there mm. and say that these are not good operational definitions, they should be changed or something. So, so is that, and, and for example, from a practical political point of view, that may, might be troublesome because it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. a political problem, right? Uh, but it might look very, very plausible from uh, like a moral <coughs> point of view or some sort of more general uh, political philosophical standpoint or something. Mm. So, uh, so I wonder if you thought any, anything about that, what, what the signs of a good definition would be. Uh, then I noticed that, I mean, this last thing that you took up with this, uh, this old uh, law scholar guy mm -hmm. found, I mean, very good points, all of them, right? Uh, but I also noticed that it seemed like, for example, that section you quoted from the UK uh, legislation that in order to have a hate crime, you would have to have an act of demonstrating hmm. some sort of communication needs to be going on. And that's observable, right? Yes. So yeah. then you're not really targeting the attitude. You're targeting a communicative content yeah. uh, or a communicative action that's being performed in conjunction with yeah. The original criminal and that's why we can have prosecutions. Yeah. That's why, they, I mean, uh, that, that was just yeah. just throwing something into the mix and, and, and the, instead of the moral and theoretical arguments. Yeah. Uh, but, then, but then again, then you can actually have the case that you communicate messages like that without having the attitude at all because language is a social thing. Mm. You can't, as an individual, decide that certain words just have certain meanings in that way. So you could have the, the demonstration and you feel n none of those emotive states or, or stances or anything, but you communicate them, for instance. So, uh, so uh, our, and I also noticed that this sort of uh, the, the victim perception part that seems to be very central in the UK mm -hmm. legislation then would also be a sort of a tool to get around the pound objection to say that, well, it's not really about whether there's an attitude there or even whether it's communicated. It has to do with whether uh, the victim here perceives something. Mm. Well, the, the victim-oriented response is the operational right. response. So there, there's no burden of proof required for recording purposes. So if a victim says, I think I was a victim of hate crime, the police are obliged to record it. Once it gets into the hands of law and prosecution, it becomes, becomes different, very different indeed. Okay. And I suspect that might come up later, so I'll I defer see, on uh, that. Okay, I see that, I understand. Yeah. It's not something we're going to talk about, oh. but yeah, it's, uh, anyway, okay. yeah, it's a difference between flagging things and yeah. statistical purposes. Yeah, I, I, yeah I see. So, so, so on, on the policing level, you have, you have like a screening tool, basically, yeah. that that has, might have a lot of... With regard to your, your first point about yeah. definitions, um, I, I think that's probably the impossible, <laughs> the impossible question. I don't, I don't know. Um, critics certainly would say, well, that's exactly why the whole concept should be abolished and we should just treat everybody the same and just have criminal law because the, the nuances that I talked about or uh, alluded to about social norms and cultural differences and different pieces of legislation make this just a minefield. 
Um, and I, I, I have serious reservations about whether a, a, a definition could be constructed that would apply everywhere, or indeed to Europe or to, to the US. Or, I mean, if you go to, to, to America, for example, the, the different states will have different definitions with different groups. So what's a hate crime on one side of the line is not well, as soon as you cross over to the other. And it becomes really, really, really tricky. Um, so the answer to your question is I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Which isn't really an answer at all. <laughs> well, I have an, an, another question, but it's a little bit related to, to Christian's question. And it's a quite open question. I don't know the answer for it. Okay. Has there been any survey within the, the field of research on hate crimes uh, that asks people the, the simple question, how much hate is tolerable? Given the, 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 my point is, hate as greed or, or something else is, is quite a quite natural thing. You all hate somebody or, or something. Mm. Uh, being a, a citizen of, of Frankfurt, where a lot of bankers are living, I know a number of people in Frankfurt who really definitely hate investment bankers. And <laughs> I would like to punish them for that. Especially not after 2008. Mm. So, is there some, some, some idea, some notion where there would be a the threshold between acceptable, uh, acceptable hate, maybe even if you're speaking or, some, uh, or abusing something, and the point where the police has to, to do some action. Mm. Maybe it's part of, of your uh, a, a I'm not aware of anything that's addressed that in the same. I mean, uh, I think there, there's a, a, you can allude to that sort of point by looking at countries that say, well, these crimes will be hate crimes and nothing else will. And you compare that to, to, to our operational definition that says, well, any incident, whether it's a crime or not a crime, um, can be recorded and investigated by, by the police. Um, obviously, in, in that latter situation, there isn't a, um, there isn't a clear cutoff point about what's acceptable and what's not. It's down to the individual and, and, and their individual perception. And then once it gets into the hands of criminal law, then decisions can be made about its propriety or, or not. But in, in uh, many places in the States, for example, they'll say, well, we'll have um, murder, manslaughter, uh, rape, um, assault, and, and they have a, a list of the crimes that are included. And indeed, many countries in the, um, um, the OSCE information that I showed had categories of, and, and if you fall outside that category, then it's not a hate crime. So in, in a sense, I guess that is alluding to what's acceptable and what's not, but it's, 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 it's very muddy water, very much. Can I just raise on that point? I mean, for me, I think sometimes it's better to approach it from the opposite angle because states have, have dictated the level of tolerance in the victimization and the crime itself, and that what, if we approach it from the motivation first and the crime second, very different than if we approach it from the crime first, because that's where the line's been drawn. And what we're talking about is the identification of motivation and complication rather than necessarily the line of acceptability. And, and I, I personally don't think that states are capable or, or have the aspiration to define that level of, of, of um, hostility. They've already defined the level of action for the crime itself. And, and I think it's easier when you look at it that way, I guess. So easy is good. I think um, there's something interesting there also, the, the level of tolerance of the victim. Because for many people who would identify themselves as possible, there's a certain acceptance of certain forms of behavior that mm. ordinarily we'd say, oh, well, you don't tell people to treat, but mentally we've got uh, some anecdotal evidence that we're trying to work up into a more formal yeah. study. We say, <coughs> actually, we put up with a lot of stuff. And then at some point, we suddenly say, no, actually, this has become more. Mm. Yeah. Just, I mean, it, it's an interesting thing. I think this lot, the line of that, that's the idea of how much is tolerated, yeah. comes from both ends. Mm. And a link with that, I have another point that's popped out of my head just then. So I'll come back to it if it pops up. Just again on the same point, I mean, we have flexibility in prosecuting. So, um, and in fact, in the UK, we've had very similar incidents to what you talk about with the bankers. Um, and w we've had a number of Public Order Act incidents and assaults where it's up to us as prosecutors to draw out the fact that it's motivated by hostility towards bankers because of the crises and whatnot. Um, and we also have the, um, what's called victim impact statements. So, with on conviction, the victim, if they want, can write a statement explaining the effects of causal effects and what they perceive the motivation to be. 
which the judge can, if they choose, take into consideration. So that's the flexible angle on it, those things that fall outside these sort of main core um, motivations for race, hate and religious hatred, that type of thing. So there's a way of dealing with it. Mm. If, if you have a look at the work of Andrew Sullivan, who's one of the big critics of of hate crime legislation and argues for the abandonment of the concept altogether. He says that this argument that hate crimes hurt more is, is, is actually redundant because people react differently to their crimes or, or their victimisation and, and to say that hate crimes always hurt more um, is, uh, is applying a, a, a sort of a crude generalisation. Now, he was writing a long time ago, 10, 10 12 years ago, um, before the evidence was, was, was really there. So that, that, that argument, I think, is being moved aside, but it raises an important, I think, theoretical point that we would need to, to, to consider. Well, I think something, I'm going to give full floor in a minute. Yeah, sure. The other angle that I was going to bring up next in relation to toleration is the way in which some things that we might consider to be hate crimes are classed as antisocial behaviour, for example, particularly in the UK, with as well as mm. the holidays that they do. Um, and then we don't actually necessarily get on the radar of you know, hate crime or the law discussion and therefore fall out of the system. And there's, again, some anecdotal evidence from some of the people we've been speaking to, where again, French we've got through more formalizing, that suggests that there's potential to show patterns of behavior and things that if it hadn't been written off as antisocial behavior and treated in a sort of semi non criminal sense, then it might not have led to some further offences that were more serious later on. So I think there's something to really try and unpick there about mm -hmm. this concept of um, where, we, where we draw that definition line. Yeah. I think, you know, in the operational sense, it's something that the problems is. Well, I think the part of the purpose of focusing on incidents, I don't know if Paul might say this later on as well, uh, was um, to. You know, to fo if you focus on the small stuff, then maybe you'll stop it escalating into into you know something m more serious. Yeah, so, Paul. Uh, well, again, I think the uh, uh, evidence from the British Crime Survey shows uh, throws light on this mm. matter uh, about how much hate is tolerable, um, because the, the analysis also shows that um, uh, perhaps counterintuitively, but the data are, are, are mm. correct are robust, that victims of physical assault. Um, but there's no statistically significant difference between the psychological and emotional symptoms reported by victims of physical assaults mm -hmm. compared with victims of so-called low-level assaults, such as threats and harassment. Mm -hmm. It seems counterintuitive, um, but there seems to be no difference um, between them. And uh, uh, hence, um, I've been a fierce critic of this notion of low-level mm -hmm. type incidents. Because they affect victims just as much as a punch on the nose. Absolutely. But uh, the self report data from victims uh, indicates that. Mm, I'd agree with that, yeah. Uh, if I may just briefly take a bit further to, to the offenders, um, Jacobs and Potter's uh, typology that you've clearly, clearly brought out. I think that also, in my mind, has a danger of um, kind of ossifying mm. offenders um, in that. Uh, you know, the emerging evidence on uh, so-called right-wing extremist offenders <laughs> shows that um, these are transient states. Mm, absolutely. The, the, ide the ideologies and prejudices are transient mm. states. That the offenders are just ordinary people like us, uh, and they don't walk mm. around uh, carrying their badges or exposing their ideas uh, uh, every day. They're just ordinary people absolutely. leading all ordinary lives. And programs designed for such offenders, so uh, there's a program in Sweden, Exit uh, Sweden, uh, the Violence Prevention Network's program in Germany. Although they're specifically <coughs> targeted at so-called right-wing extremist offenders, when you look at who they're dealing with, they're exactly the same types of offenders <laughs> that are captured by the provisions in, in Britain. Yep. These are ordinary people um, leading ordinary lives, not paid-up Nazis, mm. uh, you know, just... just ordinary people and so uh, I think also we need to be careful about kind of stereotyping mm. offenders agreed types of offenders into these Ab agreed types. absolutely yeah okay. on that note we've redig the schedule so we're going to have a coffee break now but grab a pastry because we've got lunch back tomorrow